popped into the chat box just to let me know that you can hear. That would be absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. And people are typing away and saying yes. So thanks ever so much, so much for that, guys. Right, so today um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about Tupi. And what I'm going to focus on today really is an overview of the main aspects of Tupi because it is really quite an involved piece of legislation, as I'm sure you are aware. And there's lots of different parts to it. So I'm going to look at an overview. And as Liz said, towards the end, we're going to do a poll to see if there's other sort of areas of the Tupi legislation you would like more information on, you know, more detail. And then we can run webinars on certain areas of the Tupi legislation that you are having difficulties with. So firstly, starting off, really, I mean, Tupi deals mainly with protection of employment. That's it in a, in a nutshell. You know, we're looking at organizations of all sizes and it protects employees' rights when the organization or the service then the employees work for transfers to a new employer. So it's all about protecting employment legislation rights and protecting the employees who transfer over. And it does apply in two different scenarios, which I will have a look at as part of this webinar. Just to start off with, though, there is ACAS guidance on TUPI transfers, and I don't know if you've ever looked at it yet. I think it's quite a new piece of guidance by ACAS. It's always worthwhile downloading that because it's in quite an easy to understand format, and it should hopefully answer any questions maybe going forward that you may have if you just want a quick, a quick check on. Um, previous webinar, we were asked a question as to whether there's a helpful checklist that can be shared on TUPI, so just a, a general checklist. Now, to answer your question on that, and I can't remember who it was, so I apologize, Liz, but somebody did ask the question, but the ACAS guidance does have a really useful flowchart. So if you actually go onto the ACAS website, they have designed a flowchart for TUPI legislation. So that probably will answer your question about a checklist. So you could probably download that, just pin it to your notice board, and then use that going forward um, to help with any questions that you may have on TUPI. So there's just a disclaimer there. We have to just put that up just to say that obviously it's just general advice or just general comments I'm making today, but it's not obviously, shouldn't be taken in place of actual legal advice. And then so today then, what I'm going to be looking at, as I've said, is an overview. It's the main areas of TUPI. So we'll look at the legislation that governs the TUPI transfers, when TUPI does apply for so the different scenarios, what it actually means for so this automatic transfer principle, look at the rights and liabilities that transfer the employee liability information that must be provided by the outgoing provider or employer, obligations on both employers to inform and consult with affected employees. We'll cover changes to terms and conditions briefly and the protection against dismissal. Um, just before I get into the webinar, I thought this, this was quite a useful comment. I found this on the ACAS website actually, and it was um, produced following a 2013 government impact assessment. And this government impact assessment indicated that there are currently between 26,500 and 48,000 cheapy transfers taking place each year, with the number of employees affected uh, is likely to be between 1.14 million and 2.11 million each year. So it's quite interesting, really, that obviously cheapy is a massive you know, area that does impact on a lot of organizations, and a lot of employees are affected every year about it. And I think, on, you know, going forward, that's unlikely to change. You know, Tupi is going to be here and will remain sort of an area of law that you do need to understand um, going forward. So the legislation then. So where do we find the Tupi information? So there's the legislation, Transfer of Undertakings, Protection of Employment Regulations 2006. And then we had this new legislation that came in in 2014, this Collective Redundancies and Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment Regulation 2014. And that made changes to the existing law, so that made changes to this Regulations 2006 law. And there were quite a few changes that were made, but in a nutshell, really, what the new, le new legislation said is that the rules on service provision changes will remain. So service provision changes still a cheapy transfer. But it made clear that the activities carried on after the change must be fundamentally the same as the activities carried out by the person who ceased to carry them out before the change. So I'll look at service provision change in more detail. But at one point, we thought we might get rid of service provision changes, but they, they have stayed. Um, there's still the requirement to provide employee liability information by the outgoing employer. And this now has to be provided 28 days before the transfer. 
before the 1st of May 2014, it had to be provided 14 days. So that's already been increased, which I think is more helpful to incoming employers. And we had this new decision made about micro businesses. So these are businesses with less than 10 employees because under the duty to inform and potentially the duty to consult with affected employees, you had to consult and inform with either trade union representatives or elected employee representatives. Now often for smaller businesses, it just wasn't possible and it wasn't feasible. And the government have now agreed and actually for organization with less than 10 employees, if there isn't a trade union or appointed employee representatives, then you can just consult and inform directly with the employees affected, which is what organizations potentially were doing anyway. So these, these are, that's just the main sort of legislation that you just should have in the back of your mind. And if there's ever any questions, that's where we go to, so we go and look at the legislation. And in terms of the cheapy regulations then, so they do apply, in a nutshell, when a company is sold, activities are outsourced, or brought in-house, or a contract for services is moved from one provider to another. So taking that into a bit more detail, so for when does a GP transfer apply then? So it applies to a relevant transfer. So the first type of transfer, so two relevant transfers, the first one is your business transfer. So this is often more easily understood. So a transfer of a business, sale of a business, GP generally applies. Now the statutory definition um, under the legislation is a transfer of a business undertaking or part of a business or undertaking where there is a transfer of an economic entity that retains its identity. So there's three elements to the business transfer. So there has to be an economic entity, there has to be a transfer of that entity, and that entity has to retain its identity following the transfer. Now to break that down to make it a bit more easy to understand because the legislation is quite complicated, um, in a nutshell, the regulations apply if a business or part of a business moves to a new owner or merges with another business to make a brand new employer. So if there's a transfer of the business or part of the business, then CHUPI generally will apply. So under the CHUPI regulations, the business is not judged by its name, but by the use made of its assets. So you need to look at what's actually transferring. So um, things like the premises, equipment, work in progress, goodwill or the employees, if the assets of the business are transferring um, and they've been transferred to a new employer and they're going to be used in exactly the same way, then there's likely to be a cheapy transfer. So you sort of bog standard sale of a business. If you have a cafe and the cafe owner sells the cafe to a new owner and it still trades as a cafe following the change in ownership, you know, then there's likely to be a cheapy transfer. So any employees employed in that business will transfer over to the new owner. So that, that's the first um, area in which GP applies. And like I said at the start, that's normally understood in, m more capable of being understood rather, because it's often quite easy to understand where there's been a business transfer, where there's been a sale of the assets, and it, it can be easy to understand. The next area is often the one that causes the most problems, and this is a service provision change. So this is the second area where GP applies. Now there's three different types of service provision changes. So you could have a contractor taking over activities from a client. So a client no longer wants to do a certain area and outsources it to a contractor. So you might have an IT department and decides it wants to outsource the IT. Or the new contractor takes over activities from another contractor. So it's re-tendering or re-outsourcing. So it changes providers or the client takes over activities from a contractor, so it insources the work. So using the IT example, they may have outsourced IT requirements and then decided to bring it in-house, so they're bringing back the IT um, provisions in-house. So that's, they're, they're the sort of three areas in which service provision changes do apply. Now, with the service provision changes, um, generally they don't apply if it's just a supply of goods so the transfer must include a supply of services as well, so that's the key. It must be a change in the services. Um, Chupi won't, won't apply either if the service is for single event activities or for events of short-term nature, so such as services for an exhibition that you might be putting on or something like that. It's got to be you know, a permanent change. It's got to be dealing with um, supply of services as well. Now, in addition to the um, service provision change, these following points that I put up on this next slide must also exist immediately before the transfer for the cheapy regulations to apply on service provision changes. So there must be an organized grouping of employees. 
So that group has to be deliberately organised by the employer to provide a service for a particular client. So they have to be part of the group providing that service to that client. Um, the employee should be assigned to the group, so the roles that transfer should be linked to the delivery of the services for a particular client. The client should remain the same, so if the client does change, then there won't be a cheapy transfer. The activity should not become overly fragmented, so if the activities end up being split following you know, a, a tendering exercise, so they become carried out by different providers, then cheapy probably isn't going to apply. And the activity should remain fundamentally the same. So this is quite key, really, and this is the change made by the 2014 legislation. So basically, the same work is being performed with the same equipment at the same premises, then cheapy is likely to apply. So it's got to be fundamentally the same work being carried out. And often the easiest way of understanding this is usually with cleaning contracts. So if you have a cleaning company contracted to provide cleaning services, so for, say for instance in the building I work in, it's a service office. So we don't employ cleaners. The building you know, has a contract with a cleaning company to come and do the services. So they come in and clean the building. If they then decided to tender that and put it out to other companies to quote for and then somebody else took it on, they would still provide the same cleaning services, but it would be another company doing it. So still be coming into this building, doing the same cleaning, but it would be through another company. So anyone employed by the old provider would transfer to the new provider. And then that's just then putting it into context. So the automatic transfer principle, this is the main crux of CHUPI. So what does CHUPI mean? So on a business transfer, it means all employees engaged by the outgoing employer automatically transfer to the new employer. So if CHUPI does apply, then all the employees engaged will transfer over. On the service provision change, all employees assigned to the organised grouping of employees automat automatically transfer to the incoming employer. And that, that, that is what CHUPI is. So you end up inheriting these, these employees under the CHUPI transfer. Now, I do understand with service provision changes, it can be really complicated because sometimes employees have split functions. If you go back to the cleaning example, they may not always clean for that one client, they may clean for different clients. So it's often hard to understand if they are actually assigned to that client or not. Um, and that's where obviously you have to do your investigations, that's where the employee liability information becomes relevant so you can understand who's actually assigned to the client and who isn't. And often the amount of time spent on each activity will be relevant to try and understand whether they are assigned or not. But in reality, it's not really a broad brush approach. You have to look at each case on its own facts to decide whether the employee is assigned to the organised grouping of employees or not. So turning a little bit more into some more detail then. So this is what Cheapy does then. So we have the fact that the employees will transfer over to you if a Cheapy transfer has taken place. So what transfers then? So when the employee transfers, all these rights and obligations will also transfer with them to the incoming employer. So you've got the contracts of employment and all the terms and conditions transfer over. So any terms and conditions for their employment, such as pay, commission, bonuses, holidays, sick pay, um, will all transfer to the new employer or the incoming employer. And other terms of their contracts will also transfer over, so things like job flexibility, mobility clauses, post-termination restrictions. They also get to keep the continuity of service, so that remains. Um, they also get to keep their accrued entitlements, so their accrued entitlements to holiday. And this is one of the, the areas that you have to also remember, is that the employees don't terminate when they transfer over, they just, they just transfer over and the employment continues. So what I've found in the past is some of my clients have actually whoever the outgoing employer is, have paid the employee their accrued holiday that's owed at the point of the transfer and then let them transfer over and then just start again afresh with holiday. That's actually incorrect because you, you can't pay for any holiday except for on termination. So what you have to do is just let the accrued holiday transfer over with them. So just all the accrued entitlements just transfer with them as part of the cheapy transfer. And then also the incoming employers end up with liability for any acts committed by the outgoing employer, so they inherit everything, warts and all, so if there's any ongoing claims or grievances or anything like that, that's all inherited by the new employer. So obviously it's quite a, a tricky area at times because sometimes you know you end up inheriting employees perhaps potentially when you don't know all the full information even though there is requirements 
under Chief is for certain information to be provided. And you end up taking employees on with different terms and conditions of employment to the ones that you've got in place at the moment. So it, it can be a, a tricky area to manage and often you know, it comes down to a commercial viewpoint as an organisation as to whether you proceed with the cheaper transfer or not, taking into account all of the risks. So moving on to the next area, which is the employee liability information. So when you are considering, or when you are from either point of cheaper transfer, if you're either considering taking on a contract or buying a business, or you're the outgoing employer, then these sort of areas become quite key, really. Um, the employee liability information, so I've just, I've just noticed some, some questions that have just come up um, just before I move on to this. I think Emma's just asked, what about their entitlement to flex, flexible days? If that's a contractual entitlement um, to, to days, then, that, then anything that's accrued, Emma, will just continue over in reality. So any, any accrued entitlements they've got will just continue and carry on and accrue over to the new employer. So employee liability information. So the outgoing employer has to provide to the incoming employer not less than 28 days before the transfer employee liability information. So the information that must be provided is the identities of the transferring employees, so their names and then also their ages or the dates of birth. You've also got to give employment particulars, the so Section 1 statement terms and conditions, so all the terms and conditions that apply to their employment, such as pay, sick pay, holiday, everything that you know, the company will need to know. And then also you have to disclose active and live disciplinary grievance records in the previous two years. Also you have to disclose any collective agreements and any outstanding claims that the company has against them or any potential legal actions. So if there's any outstanding claims in the previous two years or any potential legal action that you think you, know, you may be about to be hit with by, by an employee. So this information has to be presented to the incoming employer. So it gives them a, an idea of the risk really that they're taking on, an idea of the employees in the business or contracted to the client and an idea of the terms and conditions of employment and so they can be better placed to understand whether they wish to proceed or not. At this point, I just thought I might just stop for a minute and just see if anybody has any particular questions at all that they wish me to address or if you are happy for me to just carry on as I am. Like I say, it is, it is more of an overview at the moment, but I'm, I'm more than happy to obviously answer any questions that you may have. I think Emma's just asked a question to say, with the employee liability, where do we stand if we are provided with the wrong information from an outgoing provider? It's a good question, Emma, and I will come on to that on the next slide, actually, because um, there is, there is a recompense, really, if you are provided with the incorrect information or if you're not provided with the information at all. So the incoming employer or the purchaser can bring a claim in the employment tribunal within three months of the date of the transfer for any information which was not provided or which was incorrect. And you apply for compensation, which starts at a minimum of £500 for each employee. So there is quite a stringent onus, really, on the outgoing employer or the outgoing provider to make sure they provide the information and to make sure that it is correct. Uh, Joanne's asked a question, how about benefits? Do they have to be honoured? If they are a contractual benefit, Joanne, then yes. Um, so you need to understand exactly what the terms and conditions are, of employment are. If it's discretionary, then potentially no, but definitely contractually, yes. Um, Sarah's asked a question. In respect of accrued holiday and flexi time, can you, dis can you have discussions with the employee about cashing them prior to transferring over, or would you avoid that altogether? In the last cheapy, I suppose if somebody had 30 days, and the new employer did not want to take this on. That's a, I think that's the difficulty, isn't it, Sarah, with accrued holiday? Because I, I found this before, um, that you know, often as, as an incoming employer, you end up inheriting employees who haven't used the holiday, and they might, may have 20 days or something to take. The problem is that you're looking at other areas of the legislation, particularly the working time regulations, which says for holidays, you cannot be paid holidays except for on termination. So strictly speaking, it's a breach of that regulation to pay them any holiday. I mean, really, if you've got employees who have a number of holiday days left to take before the transfer, potentially one argument is they, they use the holiday before the transfer takes place, so you minimize any holiday accrual. So if, if as an organization you are thinking of selling your business or you're, you know that your contract is going to be outsourced or may change supplier, you may wish to have a look at the employees who are to be affected by that transfer. And if they have a number of days owed to them, try and get them to use that holiday before the transfer over. 
Um, Sally's asked, what are the risks if the employer tries to change their contract further down the line? Thanks for that, Sally. I will be coming on to that in a minute um, as part of this webinar, so I'll, I'll move on to that now. Um, so, yeah, so employee liability information, like I say, there is a failure, there, there is, there is sorry, a, a consequence if, if, a, if an outgoing employer fails to provide information. And I've just put up there as well about due diligence and indemnities and warranties because, you know, in addition, in addition to the employee liability information, particularly for business transfers, you know, incoming employers may wish to carry out due diligence to try and gather more information as part of the process and, and as part of a commercial agreement, have indemnities and warranties in that. So if they are, or if any information is provided incorrectly or if there's a breach, then you've got a, an extra layer of protection as well. So that's just something to just bear in mind when you're dealing with those. Um, right, obligations to inform and, and then the next slide I'll be covering obligations to consult. So, Incoming and outgoing employers must inform and consult with affected employees about every cheapy transfer and any measure they intend taking. So this will include all employees who may be affected by the transfer, such as those who will transfer, colleagues of those who will transfer, and colleagues in the new organisation who will be working alongside those who transfer. So you've got to look at who will be affected by the transfer and make sure you inform you know, with them about it. So, there's the set information that you need to include as part of the obligation to inform. So, very briefly, and I won't cover it all off, but you've got to include information about the fact that the transfer is going to take place, approximately when and why, and also any measures that the outgoing or incoming employers expect to take in respect to their own employees. And I'll come on to that next because that's when the duty to consult arises. In terms of the obligation to inform, you must inform with either recognised trade union for the affected employees, so the information must be given to a recognised trade union in writing to them. Where there is no recognised trade union, you should deliver the information to elected employee representatives. Um, and if there's no elected employee representatives, there's detailed regulations concerning the election of those in the Chupi regulations at Regulation 14. At the start, I covered off micro-businesses to say those companies with less than 10 employees can now consult and inform directly with affected employees. So the information has to be provided to the affected employees in writing and, like I say, it has to include certain information about the transfer. And in terms of the time period to provide this information, there's no set time period in the Chupi regulations. But what the Chupi regulations state is that it has to be provided long enough before the transfer to enable consultation to take place, which isn't really that helpful. But what I always say is make sure you provide the information in good time, so in good time for a proper information process to take place. And if you are considering taking measures, which is dealt with on the next slide, um, it gives you long enough to consult with the employees or their representatives, rather, or the trade union reps about any measures you are taking. So if as an outgoing or incoming employer, you are considering taking measures such as redundancies, relocation, changing pay dates or changing working patterns, anything that you are considering changing, you have to then consult with the employees about that. So you consult with them either via the trade union rep or via the elected um, employee representatives. And you have to sit down with them and talk to them in more detail about that. So on the obligation to inform and consult, you will always have an obligation to inform affected employees of the transfer, but your obligation to consult only really arises if you are considering taking measures which will impact them as part of the cheapy transfer. Now, in terms of failure to inform and consult, just, very, just briefly on this, if the parties fail to inform or consult with the affected employees, so either via their trade union representatives or the appropriate employee representatives or with them directly, then the remedy is a claim in the employment tribunal for compensation and either or both employers can be liable for compensation of up to 13 weeks gross uncapped pay for each employee affected. So there's no limit on the amount of a week's pay. Um, the award is 13 weeks in total, so it's total for each employee. So it's not 13 weeks per employer, so if it's a split liability then it's split between between the parties. So there is, there is sanctions there if you, know, if you don't follow through with the obligations to inform and then if it arises the obligation to consult. So looking at the change in terms of employment then, so just addressing your question Sally. So following a transfer, employers often find that they have employees with different terms and conditions working alongside each other and they often wish to change and harmonise those conditions. Now the problem is, cheaply protects against changes or harmonisations for an indefinite period. And even if you know, the employees agree with the changes, 
you know, the, the tribunal can override those. So you are unfortunately sometimes stuck with the changes. However, um, certain changes are permitted that can be valid. So if the terms of the contract allow the employer to make the change, then that's fine. So say, for instance, the terms of the contract allow for job flexibility or allow for a mobility clause, then you'll be okay there. Or you are allowed to make a change if the sole or principal reason for the change is an economic, technical, or organizational reason entailing changes in the workforce. So this is the ETO reason. So for this, there must be an economic, technical, or organizational reason for the change. So for example, to do with the day-to-day -day running the business. But this this ETO reason also entail changes in the workforce. So this means there has to be changes to the numbers in the workforce or changes to the job functions for it to be a valid ETO reason. Now often organisations just want to change terms and conditions financially, so maybe change people's sick pay provisions or holiday pay provisions, and that won't be regarded as entailing changes in the workforce. So for this reason, this sort of ETO defence is quite limited in practice for employers wishing to change terms and conditions of employment. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Just looking at a couple of questions, Margaret said, what about large companies who are transferring part of their business which only affects less than 10 employees? Well, if that's the case then, Margaret, it probably treated, it might be treated as a micro-business, but then you might have to look actually wider than that because if you're only transferring part of the business which only affects less than 10 employees and it is genuinely only affects less than 10 and you're not making any, it's not going to impact on, on any of the remaining employees, then you may be okay. But if it's going to impact on the remaining employees, then you may have to look at the trade union um, representatives or electing employee representatives. It's something that we'd have to have a look at in more detail for you there to sort of give you a, a definite answer there. Um, Rob said, can you make changes that benefit the employee, give them more holiday entitlement to align them with your existing workforce? I believe in cases of things like that, you can do, um, Rob. I think, I think fundamentally the changes to terms and conditions are often when people or organisations are often wanting to bring them in line with their existing staff in terms of making changes maybe more to the detriment, so where they're wanting to reduce any sick pay provisions that they have in place or reduce the sort of holiday pay provisions. So it's something usually on, on that side that's, that's dealt with on the change in terms of employment. Um, just, just moving on, because I'm just conscious of, of the time as well, just to finish off really about protection against dis dismissal. So this is the other side of the cheapy legislation you have to be aware of. So if an employee is dismissed by either the outgoing or income employer before or after the transfer, and the sole or principal reason for the dismissal is the transfer, it will be automatically unfair. However, the employee still does require qualifying service. So this is something to bear in mind. So under the employment legislation at the moment, employees require two years service for unfair dismissal claims. So in cheapy claims, they still require the two year, year service to qualify for the protection against dismissal. If they do have the two years service and they are dismissed um, because of the because of the transfer, it will be automatically unfair. Now, in terms of who is covered by this type of legislation, it's not just the employees who are transferring; it's any employee of the outgoing employer or the incoming employer who is dismissed. So, those dismissed by the outgoing employer before the transfer, whether or not they are employed in the business or part of it being transferred, are counted. Those who remain employed by the outgoing employer. Um, and do not transfer, and if they're dismissed, you know, you know, may, may be breach of the cheapy legislation. Those who transfer to the income employer and are dismissed, and anybody who's in the income and employer's business already existing in that workforce who are dismissed following new employees joining, you know, could, could be a breach of the cheapy legislation. So what you have to do is look at it from a wider angle. You have to think, you know, who, who has been affected by it. So it could be any employee of the outgoing employer or the income employer who is dismissed. So anybody under that sort of heading could be covered against this protection against dismissal under the cheapy legislation. So it does offer enhanced protection against dismissal. Um, so that's something to like I say previously for the changes in terms and conditions of employment. There is, there is a... Um, a sort of valid reason, a sort of get out really for employers, that if you have an ETO reason and the dismissal may be fair, 
So if the reason for the dismissal isn't because of the transfer itself, then it won't be automatically unfair, but you still need to make sure that you go through a fair process, otherwise it could be an unfair dismissal under the normal legislation of the Employment Rights Act. So dismissal three TO reasons, um, provided they fulfill the requirements, provided it's an economic, technical or organisation reason which entails changes in the workforce, can be a valid reason you know, to dismiss and can get you around the cheapy legislation. So things like genuine redundancies are often an ETO reason because you do have an ETO reason to make a redundancy and it will entail changes in the workforce because there will be a change in the number of employees. So often if there's a genuine redundancy scenario, then it may be a fair, fair reason to dismiss and get you outside of the cheapy legislation, but you've also got to make sure that you follow the redundancy um, process and make sure that you act fairly in treating the redundancy as a fair reason to dismiss. So that's just something to, to bear in mind. And then just to round it off really, employees who object to the transfer, not often happen, but if they do, if you do have an employee who objects to the transfer, so they may tell the outgoing employer or the outgoing service provider that they refuse to the transfer. And if they do wish to refuse, they have to submit their objection to the transfer to the outgoing employer. And if, if they do object to it, then they are treated as terminated by operation of law with effect from the transfer date. So there's no dismissal, they're just terminated by law with effect from the transfer date. And they're not entitled to anything like a redundancy pay, their employment won't transfer over, and they won't be entitled to anything like unfair dismissal rights. So it's unlikely that an employee will ever object to a transfer because you know, they're doing away with certain rights that they will have available to them. But if you, know, if you do have an employee who wants to object, then that, that's what that will mean in practice. Um, so I mean, that, that's, that's really it for now. I think I've sort of messed up to my 30 minutes time frame on a cheapy overview for you there. Like I say, it was just a, a nutshell sort of cover off of the cheapy legislation. And we have done a poll, and I think Liz will probably put that up in a minute, to cover off if, if there's more specific areas on the cheapy legislation you would like us to have a look at. because. You know, it is quite an in-depth piece of legislation. It will take more time to look at things in more detail. So we've put up, if you wanted future webinars on Cheapy, which areas would you like to see? So the things like changes to terms and conditions, obligations to inform and consult, protection against dismissal, and when does Cheapy apply? Um, you know, if you want to look at that in more detail about the sort of areas when Cheapy applies and look at the case law surrounding that. So if you just want to fill in that poll, we can have a look at that in a minute. Opportunity for any questions now, I think, as well, Caroline. Yes, Thank as well, you for that. yeah. Any you know, questions as well, yeah. Just giving people a chance Margaret. to yeah. put in, the, um, put in their um, comments. So, Margaret, so can the objection by employees be justified in any instances? Um, do you mean there where they. I'm not quite sure what you mean there, Margaret. Do you mean if they're unhappy with, with, with the sort of process that's been undertaken. I mean, if they're unhappy with the process that's been undertaken, they wouldn't object to the cheapy transfer because if they object to it, they are terminating their employment by operation of law. So they, they fundamentally then can't bring any sort of claim in the employment tribunal or take it any further. So if they are unhappy with it, then they would just raise the concerns directly with either the outgoing employer or the incoming employer. They wouldn't object to it um, because otherwise it just brings their employment to an end by operation of law on the transfer date. So you said, said Margaret, for instance, they would have to travel further. If they'd have to travel further, then um, that'd be a query that they would um, they would raise as part of the, the cheapy process. I think on one of my slides, actually, I don't think I covered this off, but the change in the location of work um, that since the change in the 2014 legislation, changing the location of work is now covered as an ETO, ETO reason under cheapy. This means any cheapy related relocations will not be treated as automatically unfair, but should still be treated in line with normal employment principles and still consult with staff. So, for instance, Margaret, if you're saying if they're unhappy with a change in location, so if, if there needs to be a valid change in location of the staff, then that potentially is an ETO reason and potentially can be fair. But the incoming and outgoing employee will still need to consult with the members of staff about that. And if they can't go to that location because it's too far, then it may be a redundancy type situation. So they wouldn't object to the transfer, they just deal with that as part of the informing and consulting process, if that makes sense. Uh, Rob, do the employee, employers have to tell employees that they have the right to object? I don't believe you do. I mean, often in the letters when you, if you give out the letters um, on the informing stage, when you have the obligation to inform stage, so you hand out the information in writing to 
the union representatives or the elected employee representatives or the employees directly. You can include that information with that letter, but I don't believe that you have to um, have to actually include that within, within that. Um, I think it's just information that's, that's available from them through their representative. It's probably good practice to put it in there, so then at least you've provided them with all the information. But strictly speaking, I'm not entirely sure that you have to, by virtue of the legislation, tell them about it. Um, so looking at the voting then that's come in, so I think have we um, published that now, Liz? Yeah, now, yep. yeah, brilliant. I think most people are saying changes to terms and conditions. I think that is quite quite a, a thorny area, isn't it, really, particularly when you have cheaper transfers and dealing with changes to terms and conditions and how you, about, how you go about those, and obviously with the sort of limitations that the legislation allows. So obviously that's something we can look to run. Um, and then I think the next one was when does cheapy apply? So obviously people would like a bit more information about the different scenarios of when cheapy applies, um, and that might may involve looking at the, the sort of case law and things like that, which could be could be interesting. William, we we'll put something together on that, Caroline, can't we? Yeah, of course we can. Yeah. Brilliant. Elizabeth, um, there's another question on the chat, and that's probably sort of the last oh, one we have time for. So Fine, I'll, how I'll let long you the employees? Yeah. I miss how long employees are covered by cheapy when Rachel asked. Also, oh, how long are employees protected under cheapy? Do you mean for changes to terms and conditions of employment? Is that the sort of area you're looking at, Rachel and Elizabeth? Just wait for them to come back yeah, to me. She said yes, that's that's the point. Yeah. I think uh, arguably it's indefinitely. That's that's unfortunately the problem with the cheapy legislation. I mean obviously we can look at this. If we do a webinar on, I think this is one of the key areas that people wanted webinars on was changes to terms and conditions. So I mean it, it, the problem is is it can be an indefinite um indefinite process. I mean, I think there are cases where if there's been a, a significant period of time changes may have happened and it may have been agreed with by the courts but it's something we can sit and have a look at um, as part of the webinar on changes to terms and conditions and look at the case law in a bit more detail which helps probably bring some more information on that to you but for the moment and certainly how the cheapy legislation works is that it just applies indefinitely. Are there any other questions? I think my chat box has uh, disappeared off my screen, Liz, so you'll <laughs> no, have to uh, shout me through if, it if, minute. if there's any yeah. more chat. If there's any more uh, questions, you'll have to, have to sell me because it seems to have disappeared off my screen. No, it, no the, so at the minute everyone's just saying thank you. Um, oh, thank so you, everybody. Really I've, put, I've put your um, slide up there for your contact details, and I will, of course, send everybody your details as well when I send through the emails as well. Victoria just asked a question with regards to employee, but I think we're possibly almost running out of time there. Um, is employee changes role with in receiving business, the new business T's and C's that apply? Caroline, do you fancy going back to Victoria on a one-to-one -one basis on an email or something with that one? Or yeah, that's fine. You just got me an email. Right? Yeah, that'd yeah. be lovely. And then I can yeah. come back to you there. That's perfect. Brilliant. We'll take yeah. it from there. Um, well, just thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Caroline. I'm sure everybody will agree that absolutely brilliant. Lo loads of useful information there, and I look forward to getting the next webinars booked in on this topic. Just very quickly before you disappear, next week we're covering restrictive covenants and employment contracts, which should be very interesting by Barrister Adam Willoughby. And our breakfast seminar on the 16th of March will be if you can achieve anything if you change your behaviour. So looking forward to that and hope you can all join us again over the next week or two. Um, and of course, please leave us your feedback. I'll put the uh, link in the chat and we've also got all the archived webinars that you can access on our website as well so thank you everybody thank you caroline thank you for the questions that came through there and look forward to speaking to you all in the, in the non-too-distant future thank you very much thank you